Uh, so Vaidhi Joshi and I first met years ago. We actually met also at Ruby on Ales uh, in 2016. I know this was this was mentioned the other night as well. Ruby on Ales, they're gonna they're gonna have to do a reunion at some point. Uh, Vaidhi is an engineering manager at Vimeo. She's also the creator of Base CS and Base DS, two amazing writing series that dive into computer science and distributed systems fundamentals. Her content is always incredibly incredible and super accessible. I highly recommend it. Uh, and so, without further ado, help me rec help me welcome Vaidhi. Hello, RailsConf. OK, listen. They gave me the end of the day slot. I don't think I had a say in it, so I'm going to need you to help me out. Hello, RailsConf. Yeah, that's better. That's better. OK, cool. Hi. <laughs> My name is Vaidehi. I'm going to move this out of the way. OK. Uh, I'm so honored and really humbled to be here with all of you today. I, there have been so many wonderful talks over the last few days. And I'm really grateful that all of you stuck it out and made it to the end. And you chose to be here. So thank you. So as Allison mentioned, I'm an engineering manager at Vimeo. And I, yeah. Look at my amazing coworkers. <laughs> so loud, full of life, here supporting me. Um, as you can, I was gonna say that they're a wonderful group of folks to work with, but I think that they've shown that. Um, and we all work on Rails and we really love it. Um, it's a great team to work with. And I'm also a Portlander. Yeah. <laughs> and I actually, I wanted to start today by saying that this talk is grounded in a very specific place, right here in Portland. So on the west side of our city, there's this massive urban park called Forest Park. And it's actually one of the largest urban forests in the country. It has, I think, around 80 miles of trails. And this talk is grounded on a very specific trail in that park which is called the Wildwood Trail. Now something you should know is that this is not one of those trails that has like some grand viewpoint at the end. No, it's more of like an out and back trail. There's no destination you're walking towards. Um, the trail like winds its way through the forest and it's basically a really long walk in the woods. And last summer, over the course of a few days, I hiked this trail from one end to the other and back again. And I think, all told, I logged around 67 miles. And today, what I'd like to offer you is the story of what brought me to this place and some of the things I learned along the way. But in order to do that, I need to rewind a bit uh, to about eight years ago, to 2014. That was the year that I wrote my very first lines of Rails code. I attended a Rails Girls event in Athens, Georgia. And for those of you not familiar, Rails Girls is this global nonprofit community that runs one day workshops with the mission of introducing women to technology, specifically through Rails. And my memory of that day is honestly a little bit blurred, the whole thing. The whole experience was a bit of a whirlwind. But there's this one moment that I really hold on to that really stands out from that day. It was the moment that I created an object in the Rails console, and then I refreshed the page, and I saw that data rendered on the browser. And I was like, holy shit. <laughs> Admittedly, I didn't know anything about web development at that time. And honestly, I think I was just typing whatever the tutorial told me to type. But that moment, when I got the data rendering on the page, oh, 
That was the delightful feeling. That feeling had me hooked, and I wanted to keep on chasing it. I wanted to know what else you could build with this framework, and then how you built those things. How could I do it? So I signed up for this boot camp called the Flatiron School. <laughs> Some light applause, yeah! There were only like three schools to choose from back then too, so this was like, you know, very exciting for me. And I jumped headfirst into learning Ruby on Rails. And since, you know, we're all friends here, I'll admit it, um, I learned a little JavaScript too. <laughs> By the end of that year, I had my first job in the industry. Within a couple of weeks of working, I was merging code into production, and I couldn't even believe I was getting paid to do this. And I remember being so excited when one day, I got some JSON rendering in the browser, and apparently I was like excited enough about this to like yell it out into the depths of the internet and share my delight with everyone. This was 2015, and there was a lot more delight on Twitter back then, I can assure you. It was that feeling again, the feeling of glee, of getting something to work the way that you wanted to. And over the next few years in my career, I found that feeling in a lot of places. Every time I you know, saw a feature that I built on production live, when I figured out a bug, when I optimized a SQL query, when I paired with a coworker and learned something new, or when I went to a tech conference and watched someone explain some new concept that I'd never heard about before. Now, there were certainly days that were hard, days where I felt stumped and I didn't feel smart enough to understand something, but the days where I was having fun debugging and pairing and figuring out how to make something work, those days overwhelmingly outnumbered the bad days. I was learning a lot every single day at work. And when I was having fun, time flew by. And the best days were the ones where I'd get into this flow state and just really get to focus on solving a problem. Those were moments of pure joy for me. And over the first few years of my career, I chased that feeling as much as I could. I was eager to deconstruct every new thing I learned about. I wanted to know how things worked under the hood. I wanted to pick things apart. And it felt like my job was a puzzle. Every day I'd go to work motivated to put the pieces together and try to solve it. And as I grew and evolved as a programmer, the things that I was interested in, they evolved too. For a while, I was really interested in computer science. Then I got kind of obsessed with like Rails framework internals. And then I really wanted to learn about distributed systems. I let my interests lead me and explore, lead me to explore new things. And that helped me cultivate a kind of joy in my work. And about six years into my career, I found myself drawn to something completely new that I'd not been interested in before. At this point, I had worked at a handful of different companies, built plenty of features, even led a couple projects of my own. But I kept coming back to the socio-technical aspects of software. I was like, I want to learn more about that. I wanted to know how do you get multiple engineers to work together to build things? What does it mean? to grow a team of engineers? And how do you empower them to work effectively? So I let my interests lead me again. I ended up joining a growing startup that was hiring senior engineers who were interested in leadership roles. And I started off as an individual contributor on that team and eventually moved into this hybrid tech lead manager, engineering manager role a few months later. And the first few weeks of this new role were really energizing. There was so much to do and so many places where we as an organization could improve. And because this company was growing and evolving and 
changing so quickly, there were also plenty of pain points in our processes and structure. And I saw ways that we could definitely make them better. And perhaps most crucially, I felt that as someone put into this leadership position, it was my job to try and fix it all. So I dove right in to help. I took on a ton of responsibilities, overhauling our product development process, writing tech specs, committing code, and trying to be a new manager and figuring out what that meant. And in hindsight, as I'm saying all of this to you, it's pretty clear to me now that this was definitely way too much. It's way too much for one person to do. But at that time, I was so consumed by the adrenaline of a new role and all of these new responsibilities and expectations that I couldn't see this. My self-awareness was clouded, and as a result, I missed the signs that something was wrong. I didn't see that what I was doing was a little unsustainable. Um, and it kind of snowballed and got, it started small and got worse from there. It started off with me just working a few extra hours here and there. This is just a hectic week, I'd tell myself. Just gotta get through this week and it'll all calm down. But it wasn't just that week. There was always something else to do. I felt like I was carrying the stack of books. And with each week and each newly encountered problem and commitment that I took on, more weight was added to my pile. A lot of weight, I guess. I forgot how many book animations there were. Um, <laughs> the pile kept on growing, and I kept on thinking that, oh, it's OK for it to grow. I can handle this. This is just a hectic month, I'd tell myself. I just got to get through this month, and then it'll get better. And I think maybe you can guess whether it got better or not. So after a few months of doing this, my psychological, emotional, and physical state steadily deteriorated. I ended each day feeling really exhausted, completely drained, and I had stress dreams about work. I'd wake up in the middle of the night agonizing about something I'd tried to do the day before. I'd drag myself to work in the mornings. Taking days off didn't really help that much because a long weekend just ended with me on Sunday night dreading having to wake up and log on the next morning. And of course, uh, a full year of pandemic life didn't help with this either. But I ignored all of the signs that my body gave me. I thought that I could power through them. And eventually I became really cynical and jaded. I was pretty unhappy and probably a little depressed. I was disillusioned with the direction that the company was going and the product that we were building. I felt ineffective hopeless, and I questioned what I was doing there and whether it meant anything. When I started that job, I started with optimism, thinking, oh, I can do this. And that turned into, I need to get through this. And then when it got really bad, it evolved, and I ended up at, I hate this. I was so optimistic and full of hope when I started, but as time went on, I devolved into an incredibly pessimistic person. And I think that person, she might have been the worst version of myself. And to be honest with all of you, the hardest part about writing this talk has been having to go back and put myself in her shoes and try to remember what it was like to be in that place. It was not a good place, and I would never wish it upon anyone. 
now. Eventually, I picked up on what was going on. A couple friends also like raised a couple of flags, thank God for good friends. And I did start to see what was happening. I began listening to these signs. I asked to drop some of my re leadership responsibilities and I scoped down my role and I promised myself I'm only gonna work 40 hours, let's not let this get out of hand. But at that point, it was too late. Even with all of those changes that I tried to make, I didn't feel proud of my work anymore. I didn't feel optimistic about any impact that I could make on the organization. Trying to power through all of that had irreversibly shaped my perspective. And in my case, at least, there was no coming back from that. So after a year and a half, I left that company with no job in hand and honestly no plan for what was next. And that was something, that was a privilege that I was really fortunate to be able to do. Now, some of you might recognize this narrative arc for what it really is. Burnout. Burnout is a term we've probably all heard a lot in the last two years. It's officially defined as a syndrome that results from chronic work-related stress. And I used to think that the definition meant that burnout was like a bad day or a bad week or a rough couple of months. But after I experienced it myself, I realized that this definition doesn't really convey how long burnout lingers on and how long it'll continue to affect you. Even after I quit my job, I didn't feel like my old self. That delightful feeling, that spark, that joy, it was gone. In fact, it had been so many months since I had felt that since I'd even felt truly excited about my work to that end, that I wasn't even sure like how, when, or if I'd even get it back. I was worried that if I didn't get myself out of that cynical, pessimistic mindset, that I might not ever enjoy building software again. And that was a really scary thought. So instead of jumping back into code, which I wasn't even sure I wanted to do, I took four months off, which again, such a privilege, and I feel very fortunate that I could do that. During that time, I rode my bike, I picked up painting again, I cooked, and I read, and I sat in the sun, and I listened to the birds, and I looked at the trees, and I recommend all of those things. But mostly, I spent a lot of time by myself in quietude. With no code to write and no job to go to, I had the space and time to do things purely for the joy of doing them. And that is how I found myself on the Wildwood Trail last summer. I decided I'd walk the entirety of it for no other reason than the fun of it. And walking those 67 miles became a kind of meditative practice for me. I had a lot of time to try and reflect and try to answer two really important questions for myself. First, how did I burn out? And second, how could I make sure that I didn't end up in that place again? And as I tried to answer these questions, I found myself going back to that first year that I started programming, that same year that I wrote those first lines of Rails code. You see, up until now, I've kind of like painted this rosy picture of like, oh, I'm chasing joy all over, delight, woohoo. But there was also something else, a little subversive, that was lurking under the surface too. And I'll introduce you to it now. Meet my imposter syndrome. 
It's that little voice that tells me, oh, I don't actually know anything about programming. And it's just a matter of time till someone finds out. And after all these years, I've dealt with my imposter syndrome by putting it in a little box and pushing it away. <laughs> I learned to live with it, but I didn't confront it. And even when I ignored my imposter syndrome and compartmentalized it, it was always there, just simmering under the surface. In fact, it's actually here today, too, um, right here with me on stage as I give this talk. All right, enough of you. Get out of here. There we go. So, as I walked that Wildwood Trail, I started to think about that imposter syndrome. I realized that even though I hadn't confronted it, it had been there the whole time. And actually, it had played a role in my burnout. I realized that no one had ever told me to work so hard at my job. No one had ever said that my role was at risk if I didn't finish that feature. No one told me the company would collapse if I didn't write that tech spec. So what made me feel like I needed to do all of that? For someone who loves to deconstruct code and figure out how things work, I had never taken the time to deconstruct what was going on inside of me. And when I really pushed myself to ask, how and why I ended up here, I realized that my imposter syndrome had been working behind the scenes the entire time. It looks cute, but oh my god. <laughs> Every hard and intimidating thing that I had done in my career was just a tiny bit fueled by this desire to prove myself and a desire to prove that I belonged in this industry, which is, you know, kind of an interesting thing to realize about yourself. Don't exactly know what that means, still unpacking it. But on one hand, my insecurities were responsible for pushing me and motivating me to do the things, all the things that I thought I couldn't do. And in a way, it's really neat to see a negative emotion lead to such positive outcomes. But the flip side of this is that my desire to prove myself had led to me having a little bit of a chip on my shoulder. And the side effects of that were decidedly less positive. Those same insecurities were the very emotions that pushed me to burn myself out, too. My imposter syndrome had a hand in convincing me of this idea that by pushing myself that hard and that long, that I could prove that I could do the job that I worked really hard to get. And that led me to being invested in my work to a really unhealthy degree. But learning this about myself gave me the tools to address and untangle this way of thinking. Once I understood what led me to burn out, I started feeling a little bit more optimistic that maybe I could avoid it a second time. And that's when I finally felt ready to dip my toes back into work again. About nine months ago, I started a new role. But when I started this job, I wasn't hopeful and optimistic. I was cautious. Even after all this time away, the cloud of burnout still hung over my head. And that cloud kind of changed the type of engineer that I was, too. I was more hesitant to speak up in meetings, to lead projects, to voice my opinions. I was worried that if I did those things, that I'd get too invested and way too overcommitted, and I'd fall into those same unhealthy patterns again. One day, I was like trying to struggle with this Rails API. I spent like half an hour trying to understand how it worked and how to get it to work with some nested React components. And then after struggling for with a while, struggling with it for a while, it happened. 
I got some data rendering on the page. You guys know how I feel about this, right? <laughs> there it was. That delightful feeling. Oh, it was back. And it put a smile on my face. I was just sitting in my office by myself, just grinning. And that was the moment that I really started to come out of that burnout. After that, I started to find that spark of joy in other places. Sorry. <laughs> so, it's not planned. I told Andy I wasn't going to get upset or emotional, so I've already failed at that. It's OK. We'll keep going. Um, <laughs> After that, I started to get that joy in other places. And I started waking up in the morning thinking about the problem I was going to solve that day. I felt more engaged at work. And the pretty cool thing is that this led me to be more interested in what I was doing, speaking up in meetings, sharing my ideas, started like raising my hand a little bit more with my team. And eventually, when an engineering manager role opened up at our organization with a lot of support and encouragement from my own manager, I raised my hand and I said, I think I can do that again. So in the last year or so, I've had so many conversations with friends in the industry about what it feels like to experience this thing And honestly, I've lost count of like how many blog posts and tweets and things I've seen in the last couple of years. It seems like I'm not alone. Everyone experiences burnout a little differently, but I, I really have noticed a couple common threads through folks I've talked to and things that I've read. Burnout causes us to lose meaning and motivation in our work. We start to get disillusioned with what we do. And sometimes we even start to loathe it. And worse still, in its worst format, it starts to make us question whether we even want to do this work anymore. Now, I will be the first to say that burnout pervades across lots of different industries. But it certainly does seem like it's on the rise in ours. And because burnout can manifest so differently for all of us and can be you know, caused by a variety of different things, I don't think that I can profess to telling any of you what I think contributes to it in tech. I don't know what causes burnout in tech exactly. But I do think that there are some truths about building software that are contributing factors. To start, software engineers aren't like other engineers who can design and create this thing and then hold it in their hands. Although, well, hang on. I'm told there apparently was a time when you could put, hold your software in your hands. Um, this definitely predates my time as a programmer, so don't ask me about it. Um, someone else might know, though. We're also not like architects who design structures and oversee how they're built. They get to walk through their work and exist in the spaces that they created. But software engineers, oh, our work is decidedly a little different. What we build is so much more ephemeral. In fact, there is no guarantee that the code we write will even be shipped. <laughs> We implement features and architect solutions and put so much effort into tech specs and dream up grand plans of the day that we can automate this thing. And sometimes we execute on them and we can see them through. And other, th other times, those projects get deprioritized and they die before being fully realized on production. Sometimes they get torn out of the code base and tossed aside often due to circumstances beyond our control. 
And when our code does survive, it's likely not going to last all that long. We either end up refactoring our code or someone else comes along and refactors it for us. The exception to this is, of course, if any of you have written any uh, COBOL code in the last 60 years, <laughs> I have good news for you. No need to worry. Your code is alive and kicking, apparently. <laughs> That's my only COBOL joke. But beyond the artifacts of what we build, the building itself can be hard. The tools we use keep changing. The list of things to learn just keeps growing, especially if you do front end. <laughs> Sorry, JavaScripters. I love you, I promise. And it can be hard to keep up with all of it. And it can be easy to doubt yourself and your ability. Oh, this died. Your ability to do the work. And the work, it's never really done, is it? It seems like there's always more to do, and we're all just trying to keep up with it. Studies have shown that overwork and long hours doesn't do us or the company any good. But despite this, there's plenty of us who still feel like we need to put in more time and more effort just to keep up. And if you're familiar with Agile or Scrum, you might have heard the term uh, sprint. It's this phrase that we use to describe like a length of time, a fixed length of time that just repeats over and over. And I don't know, like maybe this idea that we're all collectively and continuously sprinting towards something has something to do with like why we feel overwhelmed by our work. These are just some of the realities of what it means to build software today. But I think when you couple those realities with dysfunctional workplaces, unclear job expectations, and a lack of social support, those realities become harder to accept and grapple with. Ultimately, all human beings want and need to feel purpose and value in their work. And that brings me back to that delightful feeling I've been calling it joy, but perhaps an even better word for it is curiosity. I think it's this curiosity that counteracts some of those other realities of building software. And the good news is that we all have that spark of curiosity within us. In fact, it's probably that spark that got many of us into this field, isn't it? Human beings have evolved to be curious. We're hardwired to seek out information and try to make sense of it. And the science shows that when our curiosity is peaked, the part of our brain that's associated with rewards starts to get more stimulated. And in that moment, not only do our brains get this hit of dopamine, they're actually put into this state that improves our ability to learn. That spark of curiosity is what gives our work meaning. It's what gets us through the hard days when a piece of code just doesn't make any sense. It's what motivates us to get through those hard bugs. It's probably what compelled a lot of us to travel long distances to be here, to spend three days learning together. Curiosity is what keeps us going. And what sparks curiosity for me is going to be different than whatever sparks curiosity for you. Over time, the things that spark your curiosity are going to change, and that's okay. Recently, the moments that have brought me joy and made me feel curious are the ones where I see the engineers on my team flourish and grow. Now, I get that delightful feeling when I pair with an engineer on my team and I see their eyes light up with understanding. I feel joy when I'm trying to help figure out how to level up this engineer, and I find the perfect project that's going to help them get there. I get that feeling when I watch the quiet engineer on my team speak up and raise their hand in a meeting and share their perspective and opinions. This feeling can keep us afloat through the storms. When we're curious about what we do, it's easier not to get bogged down in the harder realities 
of our work. You start to do things just for the joy of it. And that can help the harder stuff fade away. And we owe it to ourselves to try to protect and guard that feeling of curiosity as much as we can. We have to try not to lose it. Because once we do, I can tell you from experience, it's a long road to get it back. It's possible, but it's painful too. So how can we protect our curiosity? I'm sure there's many ways to go about doing this, but while meditating on my own experience, I realize that there are a few things I've started doing that have helped me guard and hold on to my own curiosity. First off, I'm trying to pay closer attention to my body and mind and the signs that they send me. I think when we're so consumed with our work and when we're excited to do something, it's really easy to lose ourselves to the adrenaline and be absorbed in it. But there's a slippery slope where we lose our self-awareness and we just keep pushing ourselves to producing and sprinting through our never-ending lists and backlogs. But we're not machines, we're humans. And the signals that our bodies send us, those are the canaries in the coal mine. They're often the first sign that something's wrong. And it's really important that we don't ignore them. I'm also trying to do a better job of remembering that I have agency over my life. Sounds like I've internalized it, right? <laughs> It's really easy to blame every part of our burnout on companies and organizations and managers. And to be clear, that's not to say that there aren't toxic and unsupportive companies, organizations, and managers. There really, really are. But sometimes, the best way to protect your mental health and to guard your curiosity is to leave those situations. It's also, to remember, it's also really important to remember that quitting a job can be used as a patch or a hot fix for burnout. Yes, it helps, but just like in software, it can help with putting out the fire, but there's no guarantee that fire is not going to come back. If I've learned anything about working in tech, no company is perfect, and there are fires of different sizes everywhere. So you can't avoid it forever. It's really important that we do a proper post-mortem on what led us into those difficult situations. When I reflected on my own burnout, I saw how my own imposter syndrome contributed to it. And I think once you can identify and name a thing, you have power over it. Understanding how I burnt out, that's what gave me the confidence that I might be able to avoid it in the future. Introspection is a kind of root cause analysis. It allows us to learn from these painful experiences. So we can try to do a better job of avoiding them and preventing them from happening again. Finally, I'm also trying to teach myself to decouple my sense of self from my work. I think this is probably the hardest thing to do. But I do think it's the most poignant right now, especially given the last two years. It's been so easy to blur the lines between work and life. Work is one part of life, but it is not everything. As programmers, sometimes we really pour ourselves into what it is we do. We're easily sucked into a specific problem that we're solving or a feature we're building or the next release we're planning. And if we do that a little bit too much, then we set ourselves up to couple our sense of self with what we do. And when that happens, our identity and our work become dangerously intertwined. I'm trying to remember these days that careers are made up of different jobs, but careers themselves are so much bigger than these jobs. And again, careers are just one part of our lives. 
something that's really helped me reframe my perspective on this is this wonderful blog post from Kate Houston entitled Being Your Own DRI, or being the, no, that's not what it's called, being the DRI of your career. <laughs> DRI stands for Directly Responsible Individual. And she explains that we should all expect less from your job and more from your career. And I think this is a really wonderful sentiment. It's perhaps the healthiest perspective on work that I've ever come across. Jobs come and go, and work evolves and changes, just like the things that we're curious about. Careers, though, they're bigger than all of that. We like to think of careers as having peaks, but they're false peaks, aren't they? Even when we get that dream job, build that amazing product, speak at that conference, write that blog post, IPO that company, every single one of us, we're going to find ourselves on the other side of that goal, trying to figure out what comes next. Careers continue well beyond all of these moments. And I think if we can try to remember this, it becomes a little bit easier to cultivate a little bit of healthy detachment from these false peaks. The more that I think about it, actually, I've come to realize that careers are actually a lot like trails that way. In fact, I'd say that a career might look a lot like the Wildwood Trail. When you start on this trail, you don't exactly know what to expect. You can't always see where you're going. There are a lot of curves and bends and ins and outs, and then there are things along the way that you didn't anticipate you would run into. There are moments that are steep and slippery, moments where you really have to dig deep to try to climb up something and overcome it. There are a few ups and downs, but there are also some places where things are steady. There isn't a view at the end, but along the way you see things that really shape your perspective on the world and make you wonder. And these days I'm trying to think about my own path in tech a little bit like this trail. I like to think that if I can stay curious enough about what lies around the next bend, that that'll be a good enough reason for me to keep going. And that's my wish for all of you, too. I hope that each of you is able to take the time to reflect and care for yourself in whatever way that you need. I hope that you can find whatever it is that makes you curious and sparks delight and that you hold on to that feeling and that you keep it safe. But most of all, I hope that whatever path you're on, that every single one of you just keeps on walking. Thank you so much.